Berkeley School of Journalism, welcome to Global Journalist. I'm David Reed. Our program today will focus on the rise of Islamic militancy in North Africa. And our guests will be a photojournalist working in Mali and a BBC editor who's been covering the region for 20 years. World Watch, our new international news summary, also begins in North Africa. Tunisia's government is trying to contain the violent backlash that followed the assassination of the country's most prominent opposition leader. He was shot down in front of his home Wednesday. Protests and clashes broke out in the streets of Tunis when the news spread. Tunisia's prime minister said that he will dissolve the Islamist-led government and form a national unity administration. President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad became the first Iranian leader to visit Cairo in more than three decades. He called for a strategic alliance with Egypt and offered to loan some money to the financially ailing Arab state. The region's most populous countries have had cool relations since Iran's 1979 Islamic Revolution and Egypt's signing of a peace treaty with Israel in the same year. Ahmadinejad met privately with Egyptian President Mohamed Morsi and Turkish President Abdullah Gul to talk about the Syrian crisis. Inside neighboring Turkey, the U.S. Embassy in the capital of Ankara was targeted by a suicide bomber. A Turkish guard was killed, and the Revolutionary People's Liberation Party claimed responsibility. The Civil War, the civil war in neighboring Syria seemed to be intensifying, with fighting around the capital Damascus deemed the most ferocious in months, and there were more suicide bombings today. U.S. President, U.S. Vice President Joe Biden and French President Francois Hollande met in Paris and reportedly agreed on the necessity of peacekeeping and a peacekeeping U.S. force, U.N. force in Mali. French forces took back the city of Timbuktu from Islamic militants, but a leader said the fighters just fled to the countryside for the time being. Across to South America, a retired army general running for president in Paraguay was killed in a helicopter crash while returning from a rally. He was one of the country's most polarizing political figures, and his supporters are questioning the government's description of the crash as an accident. In Colombia, the guerrilla organization known as FARC has resumed the kidnappings of civilians and members of the security forces. And, and the country's leader reiterated the order to atten- intensify military operations throughout the country. India's president approved harsher punishment for rape. If parliament agrees, rapists face the death penalty if their victim dies. A gang rape and murder of an Indian woman two months ago caused widespread anger and demand for change. In neighboring Bangladesh, the International Crimes Tribunal charged and sentenced the leader of the Islamic Party for war crimes that that he committed in the 1971 conflict that led to Bangladesh's independence from Pakistan. The headlines in Europe this past week are less dire. The French Parliament legalized gay marriage, and experts in England solved an ancient mystery by identifying a skeleton found beneath a parking lot. It belonged to King Edward III. The 15th century monarch has lived on in history, though, as the villain in a Shakespeare play. Finally, something bad must be happening in China for the government to consider banning the lighting of fireworks during the New Year's celebration this coming weekend. But it's no mystery. Record-breaking air pollution in the central and eastern regions has captured world attention. Flights were canceled, people were hospitalized for respiratory illnesses, and factories were temporarily, temporarily closed due to the pollution. So the year of the snake is starting out more like the year of the smog. That's it for World Watch. But before we introduce our guests for the main segment of our program, here's a clip from an economist report called Jihad in North Africa, a summary of the rise in Islamic extremism and terrorism in the region. North and Western Africa, Muslims and Christians have lived side by side in relative peace for a long time. Most of the continent's Muslims are hostile to jihad. But recent events in Algeria and Mali suggest the Sahara Desert and Sahel region have become a breeding ground for Islamic terrorism and that African states are ill-equipped to deal with this growing threat. The fatal terrorist attack on a gas plant in Algeria on January the 15th was carried out by a previously unheard of group called the Signed in Blood Brigade. But violent Islamist groups have been around since the country's civil war in the 1990s. The armed Islamic group grew out of opposition to Algeria's secular leadership. Their brutal tactics, perhaps aided by the intelligence apparatus, earned them little support and they regrouped under a different name before seeking to align with Al-Qaeda in the Arab Peninsula, officially becoming Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb in 2006. 
Since then, the power of Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb has grown. The Sahara's immense size and heat make it a safer haven than drone-patrolled Afghanistan and Yemen. Money from kidnapping and trafficking has lined the organization's coffers. Libya's conflict provided an influx of weapons and Islamic fighters. Last year, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb used a rebellion led by the Tuareg people in northern Mali to gain purchase in the region. Joining forces with the rebelling Tuaregs and two smaller Islamist groups, the Movement for Unity and Jihad in West Africa and Ansar al-Din, they pushed south into the country. Mary Harper is the Africa editor of the BBC World Service. She's reported on Africa for 20 years. Pete Muller is a photojournalist based in Nairobi. He's returning to Mali this weekend to continue documenting the armed conflict that has drawn in Western countries. Pete has also been shortlisted in two categories for the Sony World Photography Awards. Why is this uh, uh, jihadi movement gaining traction now, and, and why is it getting traction there? Uh, let's start out with the, 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 with the geography, Mary. Does that have something to do with this? Well, um, the area where the um, Islamist extremists have taken over is a massive area of desert and semi-desert, so it is essentially... Uh, at least you can describe it to some degree as an ungoverned space. And if you think about where these Islamist groups have been operating uh, over the past many, many years, they have been operating across the Sahel and the Sahara Desert. I don't think they really care which country they're in. And they saw an opportunity in Mali and took advantage of chaos and confusion and actually seized uh, two-thirds of the country. Right. And, and uh, Pete, what's your take on it? Actually, I don't have a particular take. I don't feel like I have the background for that well, question. What's your experience as far as what, what people are saying to you about this uh, um, rise in uh, uh, Islamic militancy in North Africa? What are the, what, how are people talking about well, it? Well, I mean, the impression that, that I got, and, and I'm not sure, when, I was, when we were arriving in towns like Diable, uh, and, you know, following behind the French as the offensive was moving north, uh, you know, you get the, the distinct impression that um, the elements of the northern Mali conflict, which is very complicated, encompassing you know numerous factions of Tuaregs and other actors, had been sort of hijacked by these uh, Islamists, uh, these Islamists, these sort of outside actors uh, that were operating, like Mary said, in this sort of vacuous space of advantage and chaos. So there was some sense, at least from the people that we interacted with, that there was uh, you know sort of a resentment against what they perceived to be outside actors. And um, you were in the uh, town of uh, uh, Diable after it was uh, liberated from jihadist governance, governance. What did you see there? Well, what we saw in Diable was um, what, I, what I and others think was a fairly sanitized version of what may have actually taken place in that town. The dynamics of what's been happening as far as the French operations moving north in, in Mali is that they've been keeping journalists uh, really at bay as all of the live combat operations are underway. So we were all forced to wait in the neighboring town, which is sort of the staging ground of operations, called Mirno, which is about you know many kilometers, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know, probably 30, 40 kilometers, uh, away from, from Diable until we were given permission by the French and Malian forces to be able to come and visit the town and, and, and uh, observe what the situation was. And when we arrived there, we found, um, you know, many, many vehicles that had been either strafed by aerial cannon fire or hit with rockets. Um, you know, there was some evidence of fighting. There was a Malian uh, armored personnel carrier that had been uh, demolished, and inside there were three uh, bodies of Malian soldiers. So it was clear that there was, uh, you know, a, a significant uh, battle that happened in Diable, but uh, journalists were not afforded any access to the frontline situations as they were happening. And Mary, how are you? Are your uh, uh, people in in North Africa having similar difficulties getting to uh, inside Mali and seeing the conflicts? But, yeah, they're certainly having difficulty getting up to the northern towns. Uh, but when they, I mean, they have reached places like Timbuktu, and we have a reporter in Gao at the moment where there's currently fighting between the French and Islamist forces. 
Um, they describe great signs of jubilation amongst the population uh, when the French come in and drive the Islamists out. But then you do wonder, you know, if the French stay there for long, it's possible that those populations will turn their anger on, you know, what they'll see is essentially an occupation by right. their former colonial power. So I think the French are quite anxious to hand over to a, either United Nations or African force that's already on the ground. Actually, we have troops from lots of African countries there. And I think the French, you know, if they're going to be intelligent about it, they would... Uh, perform this sort of rapid strike movement and then get out and leave it to the Malians and other African troops to um, try to keep control of the north of the country and clear it of Islamist forces. Uh, and Pete, when you were in, in Mali, um, and you're going to be heading back on Sunday, what, what do the civilians think about the, uh, the French being there? Well, I, I, I certainly observe what Mary just described, which is, you know, as these as these columns of uh, French troops were were rolling forward, um, at least at Diablo anyway, there were, there certainly was a visible expression of excitement that they were there. Um, I don't think you be you are. I think we were hard pressed to encounter people who would speak openly in in, in any terms of sympathy for uh, for the Islamic fighters that have been occupying those towns, and I think certainly people. We're excited to have opportunities to return to the kind of vibrant and rich traditions that Mali's so well known for, including music and, you know, certainly enjoying things like the Africa Cup of Nations, which is underway at the beginning of the offensive. So those people were certainly excited to, uh, to, to see the French forces. And where do you, uh, as far as uh, uh, Mary Mali goes, do you um, foresee this kind of Western intervention happening? Um, whenever there's a flare-up and, and spreading to other countries in, in the near future? Well, I mean, it's interesting. If you look at a country like Somalia that's had an al-Qaeda-linked movement occupying most of the territory uh, for, what, six years now, um, you know, there, has, there have been kind of covert Western troops on the ground. There's certainly been American drone strikes. But basically, the tactic there was to use an African... A force to try to drive the Islamists out in terms of boots on the ground. So this French method in Mali uh, seems somehow a bit old-fashioned or more provocative yeah. uh, than what's happening in Somalia. And I think that many other Western powers would be quite keen to take a slightly more subtle approach towards this problem, which is spreading. I mean, it exists in Nigeria in Mali and other countries in that area, um, and also in places like Somalia, increasingly in Kenya. So it's becoming a kind of Africa-wide problem. But you, the reaction to it seems to vary according to uh, the country. Now, do you think that, uh, in retrospect, uh, that uh, France will maybe move to more covert uh, actions? Uh, do, they, do they think this boots-on-the-ground uh, uh, idea was a bad one now, or do you think that uh, it's, it's maybe just a one-off? I think, you know, for the French president, he was accused formerly, of François Hollande was accused of being weak, and this has given the opportunity to show that he's decisive and that he's bold, and I think the French are reaping quite a few domestic um, political rewards from it, but the longer that they stay there, the more difficult it's going to get. And eliminating the Islamist forces from some major towns in Mali is absolutely not the end of the war. France is quite realistic about this. It knows that uh, this is something that's going to carry on for months and months and months. But I think that they want to hand over to a non-French-led force as soon as possible. I mean, yesterday they were saying they want to be out of there by the end of March. Uh, whether that they'll succeed in that uh, is, is another question. Yeah. And... Pete, what are you expecting to see when you go back uh, this this weekend to Mali? Do you do you, do you see things kind of winding down, or are you skeptical of that? I'm I'm skeptical, and I think most people are. I think that, that Mary's really right that this, um, you know, I, I, what I what I imagine is that there's been a tactical retreat uh, on behalf of these Islamic militants, and that they're not, you know, while they were taking symbolic stands in various places, and the fighting, you know, can be sort of. Uh, more intense or less intense, depending on where they were. Fundamentally, uh, it's not in the, uh, in the uh, interest of the Islamic militants to take a conventional stand against the French special forces. So I imagine that it's been a tactical retreat, and that they will, you know, 
move farther out into areas that are not directly in combat and, and, uh, and regroup. I do imagine that this is going to be something that's going to uh, continue and, and potentially intensify um, as, they, as you start to, to they see kind of al-Qaeda hallmarks like suicide bombing and asymmetric warfare. And, and Mary, you you have to kind of decide where to position your, uh, your help decide where to position your people in North Africa. Um, are, what are your thoughts about uh, anticipating where things are going to flare up, and and whether you're going to keep the keep your focus in Mali for a while? Well, I mean, obviously Mali is now the main theatre, but you look at what happened in Algeria with the gas plant that was attacked by an Islamist group. And that ended horribly. And that was, it appears to be a direct result of what's happening in Mali. Um, it's interesting that the British Foreign Office has advised people to leave Benghazi and Libya, to leave a pretty peaceful part of Somalia called Somaliland. Um, and, you know, something could happen right. um, at any place at any time. So I think it would be wrong to predict where it's going to happen. Right. And, and we're talking about the January 16th uh, um incident where three dozen heavily armed Islamic extremists seized control of a gas plant in the Sahara Desert near uh, near in Amar Aminas. Uh, they took 650 workers hostage, uh, and then there was a battle with Algerian special forces, and, and uh, uh, I think about 37 hostages were killed. Did that, uh, is that one of the reasons, uh, I guess the main reason why people are so um, tuned into this? Does it take that kind of a dramatic... Uh, um, act to get people's attention on the, this uh, trend in North Africa that's been going on for years? Yeah, I think, you know, as soon as people, uh, audiences, own citizens, like for a British audience, when British people are involved, they become much more passionate and interested, and so does the British media. Um, the World Service that I work for tries not to have that approach to the news. Um, but it's inevitable that, you know, once the country's own citizens are affected, their media go crazy. Um, you know, Mali seems quite far away, but then when the French intervened, Britain got interested, especially when Britain started to send its own planes to help with transporting supplies. Uh, that's just the nature of people and the nature of news. And, and Pete, where do, where do you think, uh, uh, after Mali, any ideas about where... What what else needs to have the world's attention that you want to f focus your camera on? I'm sorry, can you say that again? Where, where else uh, are you thinking about going now to to, to, to document the this uh, what's happening in North Africa with the Islamic uh, extremism growing? Well, I, I've had some interest in uh, going to northern Nigeria, which I think is certainly affected by this rise in Islamic extremism. I've been working in Egypt over the last year in Italy, which is a place that's certainly dealing with these dynamics, and I, you know, I, I definitely intend to keep staying engaged with, uh, with Egypt as things progress there. We're going to uh, show uh, your photos uh, on, on, our, on our website, and, and, and we're showing them in our uh, video version of this show. Are there any photographs uh, in, in Mali that particularly kind of uh, illustrates uh, the dynamics there now. I, uh, for instance, the, the, the f there's one photo of uh, uh, civilians with soldiers. What, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that there are a couple pictures that I found interesting. I mean, one one of the pictures that I that I do like is sort of an picture that doesn't necessarily deal with the situation in terms of the offensive and the military components of it, but it's a picture that depicts a, uh, sort of an older Malian pastoralist moving his cattle at sunrise uh, along the side of a road not far from uh, from Diable and Nino. And I think that, that that picture, in a way, in an atmospheric sense, sort of uh, relates back to what Mary was talking about in the sense that this is a very large and remote and in some ways sort of vacuous environment where it is, you know, incredibly difficult to maintain control and govern these kinds of areas. And uh, ultimately, people are living a pretty isolated lifestyle out there. So to see, you know, if you can imagine through a picture like that, a scene like that that's quite typical on the sides of these roads, mm -hmm. seeing large, large convoys, hundreds of French soldiers moving forward and very sophisticated military vehicles being followed around by you know, dozens of journalists chasing them in uh, in SUVs. It's sort of a it's 
it's a bit of a surreal experience in that setting. Right. And um, Mary, I'd like to also talk to you about uh, um, Somalia, where you have a special interest. But before we continue our discussion, I want to remind everyone that you can view or listen to this program anytime by, by downloading our podcasts at globaljournalist.org. You also can find interesting articles, photos, and interviews related to our program on our website. So please send us questions or comments via globaljournalist at kbia.org or our Facebook page. You could also follow us, uh, follow us on Twitter at Global Jorn. So, Mary, um, how does Somalia fit into this dynamic? I know we, it's been a while since the world attention has been there, but they, there's been, there's been uh, 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 violence there for a, for a good while now. And where, does it, where do we stand with Somalia? Well, it's interesting because Somalia, which has uh, been, um, as I said, it's been occupied by a, an al-Qaeda-linked group for many years. Um, the past year, things have actually changed there. These African forces, Somali forces, American drone strikes have cleared those forces from most of the main cities, even though they still carry out hit-and-run attacks and suicide bombings. Uh, and they do still occupy vast amounts of the rural areas and smaller towns and villages of Somalia. But they are on the back foot in Somalia, but that doesn't mean that they've gone away. They've actually morphed into a more regionalized force, and they're quite active in Kenya, and they're recruiting a lot of non-Somalis, uh, especially Kenyans. Mm -hmm. And also what's really worrying uh, places like the United States and Britain, which have significant Somali populations, is that they're worried that disaffected members of the Somali diaspora will, um, they are becoming radicalized. Quite a few of them have gone back to Somalia, blown themselves up as suicide bombers or joined the jihad. And they're worried that they're going to come back to somewhere like the U.S. or the U.K. and conduct an act of terror there. Well, wow, that really does bring this conflict home. Now, and uh, uh, Pete, you're, you're just two countries over uh, in South Sudan. Uh, do how are the dynamics there now? Or, or uh, oh, well, actually, I'm in I'm in I'm in Nairobi. Oh, you're in Nairobi. Okay, okay. Um, That's right. All right. Now, um, so yeah, I mean, here obviously there's uh, public awareness of Kenyans. You know, the deployment of Kenyan forces in Somalia has been there for quite some time now, and uh, the military campaign that they've been uh, engaged with against the Al Shabaab, um, and yeah, that's there's some there's some it's certainly on the public in public in public consciousness here. And does it does it seem like it's uh, this movement is spreading south significantly? Uh, uh, you mean P into P Kenya? Yes. Well, I, I know that there's been a significant deterioration of the security conditions in the Dadaab refugee camp, which is bordering Somalia and northern Kenya. Um, there were a number of abductions there over the last year and a half, um, and certainly there's some concern that there's uh, been some infiltration and cross-pollination of sort of extremist elements from Somalia into Dadaab. Okay. Um and Mary, I wanted to also get your thoughts on on this this spread and and, and with this the this, this southern spread. I know that uh, in Nigeria, of course, it's it's gotten bad. Uh, any other uh, evidence of the southern movements of this uh, extremism? I mean, I think the Nigerian case is quite discreet from what's happening in the Maghreb because that movement is a homegrown Nigerian movement right. or Boko Haram. Right. Uh, but they do, you know, they want to establish a Sharia state in Nigeria. They want to overthrow the government. Uh, the Boko Haram actually means Western education is evil. So they have the same agenda. And there, has, there have been reports of links between them and the Islamists in the Maghreb and uh, the Islamists in Somalia but they seem somewhat tenuous. Uh, I think more interesting are the links between, let's say, the Islamists in Somalia and the Islamists in Yemen, who openly support each other, supply each other with uh, troops and with weapons. So, you know, you do get these parts of the world where the links are becoming increasingly strong between these movements, but then you get other places where 
they seem to operate far more discreetly, so it's difficult to see any overall pattern. Right. But definitely what you are seeing is a spread of uh, these many different groups which are extremists and Islamists and violent, even mm -hmm. though they might not always talk to each other uh, or, 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 you know, or communicate with each other. Now, I'd like to... Um Thank you, Mary. I'd like to wrap up uh, with uh, Egypt and Libya and uh, ask you both about uh, the um, emerging, emerging democracies there. Uh, first, Egypt. Uh, um, Pete, do you, do you see, see if, if do you see um, this uh, movement stabilizing somewhat? If, if, if Egypt stabilizes, do they have an influence? Well, I think to some degree people look to Egypt as a... Uh as an example, it's always been an influential country, and I think that what happens in Egypt resonates through a, a, a lot of the region. Um, but I think Egypt has its own set of, uh, you know, specific concerns, and the, the dynamics of the, the, the role and rise of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt and the success that it had in last year's elections and the sort of impasse that it's at now politically with the opposition is sort of its own set of particular issues, and I'm, I'm not necessarily confident that it's having a direct impact on, you know, the issues of Islamic fundamentalism in, in the broader North African region. Right. And Mary, in our final minute, uh, uh, what do you think about these, uh, what, the influence of Egypt and Libya? Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting that when the Arab Spring started, everybody thought, oh, this means that al-Qaeda has lost uh, its influence, you know, the the political change taking part in, in these parts of the Arab world is not Islamist extremism at all. Um, and it was like a slap in the face to al-Qaeda. But then in the chaos that has ensued after the fall of people like authorita authoritarian leaders like Gaddafi and Mubarak, you have seen the rise of um, disparate Islamist groups, particularly in Libya, um, in, in the mess that has ensued. So the situation is not nearly as clear-cut as people were predicting. Right. Well, thank you so much, Mary and Pete, for uh, helping us understand this widening conflict. Uh, we've come to the end of this week's edition of Global Journalist. Joining us today, again, were BBC's Mary Harper and photographer Pete Muller. Our program is produced by the Reynolds Journalism Institute and the Missouri School of Journalism. Our program is directed by Travis McMillan, audio by Pat Akers. Raymond Tungakar is our executive producer. Servani Per was the lead producer for this program. And join us again next week for another Global Journalist. I'm David Reed. Mm -hmm.